Uh, welcome all, eight o'clock on this lovely Tuesday morning to the last in our series uh, brought to you by the Hawaii Children's Action Network, the Department of Health, Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Program. Today, we're delighted to have Davis Ruderer, who is originally from the Republic of Palau and lived in Hawaii for over 20 years now. He's a program manager, the Department of Psychiatry at the John A. Burns School of Medicine and is a candidate for the Masters of Public Health program at the University of Hawaii Manoa. He's worked on numerous initiatives on youth violence prevention, suicide prevention, substance abuse intervention, behavioral health and primary care integration, along with a K-12 academic empowerment and adult career planning. The majority of which of, of these is focused on our native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders and Micronesian populations. His areas of interest include education, health and mental health and behavioral wellness among Pacific Islanders in general and Micronesians in the Micronesian diaspora in particular. I first heard Dave uh, a couple of months ago, he did a presentation for, I think it was just our division at the Department of Health and uh, he hadn't even gone five minutes into his talk. And I thought, I need to bring Dave to uh, the larger community. So Dave, I'm so pleased that you were able to make time for us. And uh, please uh, go on with your presentation. And I know all will enjoy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sorensen. I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity to speak um, today and to everybody, good morning. Thank you for joining us um, so early in the morning. I am not a morning person. So <laughs> if you are also not a morning person, uh, we'll, we'll commiserate together. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, um, I've been doing uh, Micronesian awareness presentations uh, for many years now, actually. Um, but I'm always finding that I, I, I want to do more because I think there's not a lot of knowledge to be learned um, about this uh, particular population um, out there. And I'm very happy to, uh, to, uh, to be part of that, to be able to talk about uh, Micronesians and where we're from and what we're all about. Um, so this, I'm again, I'm Dave. I'm a program manager at the Department of Psychiatry at the School of Medicine. So my focus has been over these years on mental health and behavioral health. Um, and, uh, and it's mainly been focused on Native Hawaiians and what, uh, what I, um, uh, I've been lucky at where I work, they realized that um, um, there needs, no, work needs to be done on the Micronesian population as well. So they gave me the opportunity to be able to do those kind of work uh, whenever I can, there's generally no funding. Um, so uh, the, the department has been very generous in giving me the time and the, uh, the opportunity to do those things. So uh, like I said, I've been doing this for this talk for many years and it's uh, this specific, this particular iteration has, uh, this is one of many, many iterations. It actually started off, like I said, I was writing a, um, uh, literature review, a systematic literature review on mental health among Micronesian. Started off with at, among Micronesians in the home islands, and then it became uh, Micronesian migrants. And so my first talk ever on this subject was on just specifically on mental health and behavioral health among Micronesian migrants. And as I gave that talk in those first few talks, I realized that I really kind of had to pull back and provide really more back, background and context to it. Because people were interested, I mean, they liked the, um, the mental health, behavioral health uh, aspects, but they were also asking questions like, where is Micronesia or who are Micronesians? So I, I really, I found that I had to pull back and um, provide that. So this presentation that you're gonna see is really more of a background and uh, context, more, it, it covers historical, um, aspects that uh, were never part of the first uh, presentation. But first, um, aloha, Rananim, Yakwe, Lenwo, Kasilalia, Mogedin, Ali, and Hafadai. Hello. Um, 
Again, I'm from Palau, so if I if you happen to be from those other islands, then I mispronounced that. I I apologize. Um, so yeah, so what we're going to be talking about today, these are the objectives. I hope that um, after the talk, you'll at least be a little bit more informed. So I'm going to provide background and context, um, including like where is the Micronesian region. There's a lot of historical trauma that um, been happening in the region and to Micronesians over the past uh, 100 years. So I'm going to go into that and uh, compacts of free association, which I also known as COFA, which I think uh, all of you have heard that term. Um, and then uh, we're getting to migration. Um, and then I'll talk about um, health issues for Micronesian migrants in the US, uh, social determinants of health. I'll talk about social ecological model, kind of like what may be driving the uh, this health disparities and inequities. And then COVID-19, we have to talk about that. Um, we're smack dab in the middle of Delta right now. We thought we're out of it, but we're right back in it. Um, and then I'll talk about just based on what the literature says, like what, for those who provide services, what would be part of like an informed services, like you're aware uh, of the Micronesian clients that you may be dealing with. Um, so that would go towards um, awareness, you want to focus on strengths and resilience on cultural aspects and then what a culturally accurate program might be. Ideally, we want to do that, but uh, I realize in the big world that's not always um, possible, but it's kind of, at least kind of good to know that what a culturally accurate program would look like. And then finally, um, I, I want to end with just some contributions. Um, as a Micronesian, I've seen a lot of Unfortunately, a lot of uh, racism, discrimination, and negativity stigma towards directed towards uh, Micronesians. So I kind of want to try and flip that on its head. And yes, there's some issues with this population. I'm not denying that. But there's also contributions that have been made. So I kind of want to just highlight that to kind of show that you know Micronesians are contributing uh, to society. Uh, and so that would be at the national military level, uh, some business, uh, local level, cultural practices. And then at the end, I'm gonna give a virtual tour of the islands just so that you see what we're talking about. Like at least you hear uh, Chilk, you hear Guam, you hear Palau, uh, but what do they actually look like? So I'm gonna go uh, into that. So I'm gonna apologize beforehand. There's a lot of information I'm gonna throw at you. Some of the slides are gonna be pretty busy, um, um, but um, I'm just, again, these opportunities, opportunities do not come up a lot, so um, I just want to be able to share as much as I can with the time I'm given. And then finally, um, off to the right, what you're seeing there is an image of a mask. Actually, this is from Chuk in this case. Um, I so I, you know I'm I want to provide all this information, but I uh, I also want to showcase in some way. Um, uh, uh, Micronesian culture and heritage, and um, which you know I just don't think let's not have the opportunity. So I'm just kind of sticking on there. I don't know if this works. If this may be distracting, and if so, I apologize. And if you have feedback either way, uh, please let me know at the end. Um, so those I'm going to have images like that just so that at least with Micronesian culture, she can at least see that you know there's history and there's culture behind these people that we're talking about. Like we're, we're in Hawaii, we're very familiar with uh, Hawaiian culture. And um, I kind of want to at least kind of provide that sense, initial sense of what uh, Micronesian cultures uh, kind of look like. Um, and I wanna also want to just go ahead and say that I'm using Micronesian term Micronesian a lot, um, but um, just know that there is no one Micronesian culture. The, the, there's many different uh, cultures and languages. It's like Polynesia and it's like Melanesia. It's really just a term that describes an, a geocultural area, but it's not um, a country in and of itself. Uh, and that's confusing when it comes to the federated states of Micronesia because they're a country. But the term itself, Micronesia, is just a term that covers uh, that area in the Pacific that these islands happily, uh, happen to be on. 
So I hope this kind of gives you an idea of what I'm going to go into today. Into today. And then at the end of the talk, um, there'll be questions. There'll, have, there'll be my contact information. So if you want to, um, again, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy to give this presentation. If you want me to do more presentation to your specific organization, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Or if you want to just uh, get in contact and have questions and discuss more, uh, I can do that as well. Or maybe direct you to uh, resources that uh, uh, may be able to help uh, your uh, specific question. Uh, yeah. So, okay, let's get going. So like I said, I had to really pull back from the beginning, I had to pull back and provide really kind of a background and context before I really go into uh, my talks uh, that were in the beginning. Uh, so let me, sorry, let me real quick, let me backtrack and just say for the images that are to the right uh, and to the left of the slides. Um, so those are there, but I'm not gonna be talking about those. Those are just there and, um, but I'm not going to get in, getting into it. I'm just I'm just showing that. Um, so Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. Uh, I apologize if you already know this, but some actually folks don't. So just to be sure, um, I'm just putting this out there. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, so the Pacific Ocean pretty much uh, three general areas that are, that are talking about Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. We're all very aware of Polynesia. Polynesia, many islands. So there's Hawaii at the top there. So it's to the right in, in the gray color. There's Hawaii down to Tonga to the left, and then French Polynesia to the right. You're not seeing Easter Island, but that's known as the uh, Polynesian Triangle. Um, so when people think of the South Pacific or the Pacific, that's what they're thinking of Polynesia. Um, you also, the other two areas are not as well known. Um, the, the Melanesia, which is in blue, just above Australia. Um, Melanesia, I mean, I mean, dark islands. Because um, uh, the people there, uh, the, the Europeans at that time said, oh, they're darker than the others, so they call them Melanesia. Dark. The, the terms themselves are problematic. Uh, I'm not really going to get into that, but I could spend all day talking about these terms. And uh, uh, But um, uh, Melanesia means the dark islands, and it refers to the countries in the blue there, the dark blue. So that's countries like Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, and Fiji. Of all those countries, Fiji is probably the most well-known. Fiji is a major tourist destination in the Pacific. Um, oh, just to, uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of data at you. This is all pre-COVID. So just like Hawaii, just, uh, nothing's happening right now because of Hawaii's opened up, but most of the uh, Pacific Islands are still closed down. Um, and then finally, Micronesia, which is in uh, green there in the upper middle portion. So there's uh, going from left to right, uh, there's Palau at the northwestern end of Micronesia, Federal States of Micronesia in the middle there, Marshall Islands. Uh, Nauru and Kiribati, and then Northern Mariana Islands at the top. You're not seeing Guam, but Guam is right. That dot you're seeing right there between the Northern Mariana Islands and the Federal States of Micronesia. So when we're talking about Micronesia, we, in the US, we, we're usually talking about Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Palau, Federal States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. Those are the islands that are uh, affiliated with the US or have a relationship with the US. Nauru and Kiribati are also in the Micronesia region and their peoples uh, may be considered Micronesian, but they're more, they don't have a history with the US. So they're more affiliated with New Zealand and uh, Australia. So we don't really talk to about them as much, but they are part of the region. So these are the three general areas uh, in the Pacific. We're gonna, gonna dive a little bit more deep into Micronesia itself. So what you're seeing there, and I should have split this uh, images up. I'm sorry if they're small and they can, you cannot read them, but on the left uh, in white, the map in white, this is just to give you an idea of how big the region is. So if you'll see there's Palau off to the left there, if you can see the cursor, and then Republic of the Marshall Islands is to the right. And then you can actually fit the continental United States in there with room to spare. So and there, and there's Guam in this map, you see Guam. 
um, and then another man ends up there. But yeah, you can fit the continental US in there with room to spare. So it gives you an idea of how big the area is, uh, this expanse of, of ocean. And then within that, there's thousands and thousands of small little islands that uh, people live on. And then on the right in blue, the map in blue, this is a close up of the Federated States of Micronesia, which has four states, Yap, Chuk, Puente, um, and Kasrai. And then, so all those are islands with their names. You, you kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about when I say there's a lot of small islands. Um, so in Yap itself, there's all these islands. Yap is uh, the colony state. So that's the capital of Yap right there. There's Ulithi, Faisal, all, all these other islands. Um, and then Chuk also has many, many, many um, islands. Pompei uh, doesn't have as many islands. Pompei is the capital of the FSM. Uh, and then Kasrai is actually, uh, they don't, it's an island state by itself. It's unusual among all the others because it only has that one, their one island. Um, and then here you see Nukuoro and Kapinga Marangi. These are, uh, as you can see, they're outliers, but also in the sense that people from Nukuoro and Kapinga Marangi are actually Polynesian. Uh, they're more, uh, I guess, more Polynesian in their, um, uh, we don't know how they actually ended up in this part. We, we just thought that maybe they drifted back over from Polynesia and then settled uh, in these two islands in Pompeii. So people from there, they have, they can speak Pompeii and they can speak, because uh, they are Pompeii, because they're born and raised in Pompeii, they can speak Pompeii, they can speak English, and they can also speak their uh, Polynesian languages, the Korean and Kaping Um uh, so just to give you an idea, and also these islands, which some are inhabited, I would say most, I'm not really sure actually how many I'm here, but that really represents, presents challenges in really just healthcare uh, delivery service, because you cannot just get in a car and drive. Um, some of the people who live on these islands usually have to get on a boat uh, that takes a day or two to get to the capital. Uh, and then in this, in, uh, in Chuk's case, that would be uh, Moen right here. It's called Weno now, this is map is a bit old. But, um, so that's the capital that people who live on, on, on these islands, if they, need, if they need treatment, they have to go to Moen, but they cannot just jump in a car and go there to take a boat to get there. And if the weather's really bad, you don't want to do that because you don't want to get overturned, at, you know, your boat overturned at sea or get, you want to get lost at sea. So it's, it's really just, because of uh, how the islands are, that it, it makes it really hard to um, deliver healthcare services. And then even within the capitals themselves, so Weno, Moen or Weno is the capital of, Ch of Chuk. Uh, Colonia is, of Palikir is the capital of Ponte. Uh, Colonia is the capital of um, Yap. Um, they are quote unquote developed relatively developed to relative to the uh, other islands, but they are also a little bit more, uh, they have more infrastructure, they have they have where the main hospitals are, where the main government services are. Uh, but even then, as capital, they have more resources, but there's still a lot of, um, as you, you'll see, there's still a lot of uh, 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 like uh, infrastructure is not as, um, is not enough to meet the needs of the, the population. That's true actually for all of Micronesia. So we talk about a lot about, you know, this, and I just did it like there's this big, big, big expansive ocean and all these little islands in between. Um, but there's actually, Micronesia, uh, Pacific Islanders actually think of the ocean not as uh, something that separates them, but it's just a part of who they are, just, just a natural uh, part of their being. This quote, uh, at the bottom there from the Tongan scholar, uh, Epini Ho'ofo kind of really kind of encapsulates that. He says that Pacific Islanders were connected rather than separated by the sea, far from being sea like peoples maroon on coral or volcanic strip, strips of land, islanders formed an oceanic community based on voyaging. And that is true, a lot of these islands, um, uh, even though it's, it's far flung, they, they still had to communicate with each other, they still had to move from one space to another, and they did that through their voyaging. Uh, and that's how uh, 
uh, even Polynesians did that, the native ones did that. Um, but in the Micronesian region, they were at, especially in the area between Chuk and Yap, uh, they're called Carolinians, people from there. They were able to hang on to that uh, uh, open ocean voyaging canoeing. Um, and Mao Pialuk, who's, who's from Satawal right there, he's the one who came to Hawaii and taught Nainoa Thompson how to navigate by the stars without using any uh, mother equipment. And then through that, it really uh, sparked interest in open ocean voyaging and helped Native Hawaiians and Polynesians and people from Guam to, to, to really delve back into uh, their open ocean, uh, ocean uh, open ocean function. So that kind of gives you an idea of the Micronesian uh, region um, and a glass. Um, so I'm, these are the islands I'm gonna be, or territory states I'm gonna be talking about when I talk about the United States affiliated the Pacific Island, Micronesia, um, US API, Micronesia. Usually when we say United States Pacific Islands, we also include American Samoa because that's, uh, territory of the US, but we're talking about Micronesia. So just these are the ones that we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, so to the left, you see Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So those are US territories. And if you're born there, you're an American citizen because those are US territories. Um, um, and then to the right, those are these are the compact appreciation or COFA as you're familiar with that term. Uh, so these are what they're called the COFA countries. These, these are independent countries that have this COFA relationship with the United States. And I'll go, I'll, I'll go a bit deeper into that uh, later on in the presentation. But these countries are the federal states of Micronesia, which I'm just gonna call FSM from now on. Uh, Republic of the Marshall Islands, I'm just gonna call them uh, RM or Marshall Islands. And then Republic of Palau, I'm gonna just refer to Palau um, going forward. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, if you're from, if you're born in Guam, or if you're from Guam and Carmel, you know, the Marinas, you're um, an American citizen. I was actually born in Guam. I'm from Palau, I was raised in Palau, but I was actually born in Guam. My parents are Palauan, uh, but my mom hit me on Guam. So I'm an American citizen. If I wanted to, I could go and get my Palauan citizenship and have dual citizenship, but um, my American citizenship for now. Uh, so the US territories and compacts of free association. Um, I apologize, this is a very busy slide. Um, but I kind of wanted to show the political status and the citizenship and some indigenous languages and populations of the Micronesian region. So to the left, you have uh, the areas of Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, FSM, with the states, Marshall Islands, and Palau. And then political status. So Guam is an unincorporated territory. I don't really know what that means, but again, like people that are your citizens, um, Northern Mariana Islands, uh, it's a commonwealth. So they're like uh, Puerto Rico their political status. They're also uh, US citizens. Uh, indigenous peoples from Guam are, they're called Chamorro. Um, and then from the Northern Mariana Islands, they also have, well, indigenous, they're Chamorro. Carolinians are actually migrants. Uh, so they're not actually indigenous to uh, the Northern Mariana Islands, but they've been in there for a long time. Carolinians are Micronesians, um, who were uh, moved to Saipan because of their islands were ravaged by a typhoon. Uh, I think this is sometime in the 1800s. So they've been in, in Commonwealth of Northern Islands for um, a long time now. Um, and then we have the FSM, uh, Federal States of Micronesia with the four states. And then within that, there's, you know, they have their own. Um, so if you're born there, you're an FSM national uh, citizen. And then there's, each state really pretty much has its own language, Chukis, in this case, Chukis, and then they also have Carolinians. Kushrayans are, they're kind of just kind of by themselves, uh, they're Kushrayan, and then Pompei State, there's Pompei, and then, like I said, there's Nukuoro, Papingamarani, but there's also islands that have, and I'm thinking of Mokil, that actually the people there are from, their ancestors are from the Marshall Islands, and I'm not sure how they ended up in an island on Mokil in Pompei State. Uh, so they have their own languages as well. I just didn't list everything, but that kind of gives you an idea of, of the diversity uh, of um, these islands. And then you have state, 
uh, yeah, peas, and then just an example, you you, and you saw those all those small little islands. A lot of them they have kind of have their own uh, language that's common, but it's unique in the same sense that you know kind of like a dialect. Um, and then Marshall Islands uh, and and Palau too. Um, so there's been a lot of historical trauma associated with the uh, Micronesian region and uh, in the, that the Micronesians have, have actually gone through over the years, uh, starting with uh, colonization. Um, it really started off um, in Guam and uh, the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, Spain was the first one to colonize the island. I think they started sometime in the, I want to say, uh, 15, 1600s, I think. Um, and so because of that, actually Guam and the Northern Mariana the Chamorro people, amongst all the Micronesian cultures, they're the ones who've lost a lot of the language and customs and culture. Uh, because uh, for some reason, Spain really just concentrate on those islands and didn't really go into the other Micronesian regions or islands. So um, the Chamorro culture has lost a lot. Um, and to their credit, they're trying to get it back. Uh, they're slowly reclaiming their language and cultures and uh, customs and protocol. Uh, but it's interesting when you listen to them speak Chamorro, their version is a mixture of language of Chamorro that they have and also a lot of Spanish words because they just lost so much of their culture that they don't know uh, some of the terms, Chamorro terms they don't have, so they have to depend on, on, on Spanish to be able to uh, communicate. So uh, a lot of people are becoming more, um, uh, can speak more uh, Chamorro, but again, it's a, it's a mixture of Chamorro and uh, Spanish. Um, so really kind of uh, with that, there's uh, loss of language, customs, and culture, even for the islands that were not as affected as Guam, um, they still lost a lot of some of the language and uh, culture. Uh, like, for example, when the missionaries came over, um, they really kind of forbid a lot of the cultural aspects, uh, practices that were happening in the islands um, and kind of converted people to uh, Christianity and away from their local um, religions. So to this day, across the Micronesian region, Catholicism is the dominant religion. A lot of people are religious. Um, and then, uh, uh, there's, so there's a lot of Catholics and Protestants as well. Um, really kind of the only kind of quote unquote religion that kind of been able to survive is Mwadakne in Palau, which is kind of a, a combination of uh, a local religion and, and Christianity. Um, they have their own school. Actually, it's, it's kind of cool because they focus uh, mainly on Palau uh, customs. Um, but so with that, there was really steep population decline because as Western culture contact was made, as with a lot of other uh, populations in the Pacific, because uh, Micronesians and Pacific Islands were um, introduced to diseases that they just had no defense where they were never exposed to it. Uh, and so the steep population decline. In the case of Kushrai, their, their um, population declined by 90%. Uh, and the region as a whole, I think the population went down between 40 and 50% uh, right after Western contact. And it only recovered to pre-contact levels right after World War II. And since then it's, it's grown a lot, but um, there was a huge population decline. Um, and then World War II, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, had um, actually a huge impact in the Micronesian islands. So this is something that a lot of people are not aware of, how uh, uh, in the Micronesian region, World War II, there was a uh, large conflict between uh, uh, Americans and Japanese. And then right after World War II, there's nuclear weapons testing in the Marshall Islands, which some of you may be familiar with. I'm going to cover that in one of the next slides. Um, and then there's this idea of benign neglect, um, which uh, refers to the period like right after World War II, the United Nations, I'm not sure if they were called United Nations at that time, but they had what they called trust territories that they were gonna assign to um, countries that were in World War and that were uh, 
um, we're on the Victoria slide that they uh, were to help these trust territories be able to uh, develop their economies and become uh, self-sustaining uh, independent countries in the future. And, and one example of those trust territories, and I think there were 13 to begin with, but one was the trust area of the Pacific Islands, which included all the islands in the Pacific that I just talked about, except Guam. Guam was a US territory, even back then. Uh, so right after World War II, this history of 13 trust territories, um, and the US petitioned to take over the Micronesian um, uh, trust territory. Uh, and uh, they said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take over, we'll, we'll do the, um, the Micronesian region. So the UN uh, gave the US the mandate to look over the Micronesian islands, control the Micronesian islands and help towards develop towards uh, independence in the future. Uh, but what happened right after World War II was, because during World War II, the, the United States recognized that the Micronesian region was very strategic militarily. Um, and so they wanted to hang on to that. So the US Navy, even though the US had said, hey, we'll take over, it was the US Navy that actually took control of the islands right after World War II. Um, and then right after that, they started nuclear weapons testing in the Marshall Islands, which I'm gonna talk to. And then that period from between World War II to um, right until the early 1960s with the Kennedy administration, Micronesia was effectively blocked off. A lot of people couldn't get in. Micronesia really couldn't get out because the Navy was in charge and they basically shut things down. Um, and through all that time, they really didn't do anything to, uh, in the way of um, making sure the, the, the islands were able to um, uh, develop um, their um, economies or their, uh, and so then the US really got uh, accused of, then got accused of, because you know, they were right after World War II, uh, the, the United States like, hey, you know, we're, we're a free country. We, we don't um, uh, impose our will on other countries. We're here to help these countries. But at the same time, they kind of blocked off access to the Micronesian Islands. And they're also very, very sensitive, especially around when the Kennedy admission came in. They're really sensitive to that. Like, we're not colonizers. We don't do that anymore. But uh, because of their control over the United, of the Micronesian region, they, they came under heavy criticism from the, the United Nations, which had said, hey, you guys were supposed to do this, but you're not doing that. And then also like the Soviet Union, which was a power at that time, which accused the United States of being, uh, of being hypocrites for espousing freedom and uh, freedom of movement and being non-colonizers, but at the same time, they were uh, isolating uh, Micronesians away from everybody else. So uh, in response to that, the, the Kennedy administration then said, hey, you gotta, you gotta show that we're, you know, we're not like that. So they kind of opened up um, uh, the region a little bit and then she really started to just, in a sense, throw money at Micronesia and that's just started, hey, let's start going in and, and helping them the Micronesia in what way we in any way we can. But it wasn't really in any systemic way. It's just, hey, let's go in and set up all these Western-based systems and institutions like education, health, but not really taking into account the local way of doing things, the culture, uh, the Micronesian, not really incorporating Micronesian culture into these systems. They just went in and put all these Western-based systems in it. Um, and so, and then just, you know, like, hey, this is, this is how it's gonna be done. So it was never really kind of um, a transition. It was just here, let's do it this way. And then that's when the Peace Corps, they did a lot of good, but a lot of um, uh, systems also were just kind of thrown into the region. And so that really kind of helped to bring the subsist subsistence uh, way of living to a cash economy, which actually had implications there because a lot of people were not, uh, uh, prepare for that and really only Micronesians who were smart enough to be able to open businesses really uh, were able to benefit from that and then that um, also had implications as far as I'm kind of just generalizing here um, and from the extended family to nuclear family that implication one of the implications there was that young males who under the extended family they kind of had roles you know they were um, role models for their nieces and nephews, especially on the mother's side. 
like most Micronesian uh, uh, cultures are matrilineal. So the brothers of the mother, in some instances had more say um, in their sister's children than their children's own father. That's you know, kind of how it was. Um, and they also had kind of roles that they played, but when you became kind of a nuclear family, then the young men who didn't really have families of their, their own kind of did not have anything uh, to do, as it were. So part of the education was that didn't really turn to substance abuse and doing a lot of drinking and drugs against Apple really started happening in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so all that is one of the, uh, what's happening here is that there's a lot of dependency on the US. Basically, these islands cannot be independent the way things are right now. We are dependent on the US. We cannot live without the US, which is not the mandate that the United Nations had set out to. There's a lot into that, but um, I, I, I didn't really define benign neglect, but it was the idea that um, uh, the U.S. didn't really pay, uh, specifically the U.S. Navy didn't really pay attention to uh, what they were supposed to do, which is help develop the islands. They're kind of like, yeah, we're there. They're not actively trying to destroy the culture, but they're also at the same time really not doing anything to uh, help. So benign neglect kind of leading to uh, dependency on the U.S. Um, and then also what's going on right now is climate change. I just realized that's a typo there, it should be climate change, which is really happening um, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, the Marshall Islands uh, is, there's a, over a thousand islands, but they're really small and flat and narrow. And uh, in the Marshall Islands, I think the highest, highest point is 10 feet above sea level, but it's, it's a bridge. So it's very low and they're really, really, susceptible to the effects of climate change. They're already actually started suffering. Also the other, not just Micronesian islands, but a lot of Pacific islands are going through that as well. Uh, Kiribati is having, uh, and Tuvalu are having um, issues from um, climate change. So real kind of quickly kind of um, thing on what's happening as far as historical trauma. And I think it's, all this has kind of contributed to what's happening um, right now in the, um, in the Micronesian Islands. So this is specifically World War II. Um, uh, so there's, there were accidental bomb killings of Micronesians from the uh, US uh, bomb raids that they were targeting Japanese, but um, you know, uh, some Micronesians were um, killed accidentally. As the war went on and, and food became really scarce, food and crops that were Normally, the Micronesian families used to feed their families. They had to be given over to Japanese soldiers. Um, and things got to the point where Micronesians actually, they had to flee their homes. They would hide, go hide in caves, they would for water, like live in the jungle uh, for water and food. And they would only fish at night because it wasn't safe to be out during the day because of uh, the US bomb raids and also Japanese soldiers were out and about and they, they were restricting movement. Um, of Micronesians, and if they came across Micronesians, they would demand, hey, go get me food, go get us water, things like that. So they, they kind of had to um, uh, to be saved by their families. So they were forced from their homes, they suffered uh, poor treatment, they had to do hard labor. Uh, these were starvation beset, both Japanese soldiers and Micronesian citizens as well. Um, unfortunately, there were executions. Micronesians were executed, those who were disobedient or uh, didn't meet some two. Um, they, the U.S. Navy started these and they actually approached one of the chiefs and said, hey, let's, oh, I think it was Bikini Atoll, like, hey, let's, can we do this? And this is, quote unquote, for the good of mankind. Um, and they approached the, the chief who was actually a Christian by then and they convinced that the chief, like, let us move your people from your island, we'll move you guys to another island where you're nice and safe and then we'll do this for the good of mankind. So the chief agreed and, and you see upper left, um, they were, uh, these uh, women are being evacuated to another island. Um, again, I think this is from Bikini Atoll, I could be wrong. And then the image next to that, this is Castle Bravo, which I think is the largest ever nuclear um, uh, testing that ever took place. 
and you just see the scale of that. I think the image next to that in red, I think is another version of that image from another perspective, I believe. And then to the right, uh, if I'm correct, this is Bikini Atoll. Um, so the crater that you see there, that's the result of, um, I think one of the um, explosions that took place, which pretty much evaporated an island. So that, that crater is not natural, it's from the nuclear weapons testing. Um, lower left, you're seeing an image of a um, uh, young boy who's actually was exposed to uh, radiation from uh, the testing that took place. Um, this is just one of the images that I could show, but um, uh, really the, the, the health consequences of this nuclear testing has really affected Marshallese from to this day. I mean, uh, uh, but immediately after that, there was a lot of cancer. There was a lot of birth defects uh, uh, of uh, Marshallese folks, but a lot of people don't know that. And actually right after one of the testings took place, radioactive ash drifted over to one of the islands. And so the, the children actually went and played in there in the radioactive ash thinking that it was snow. So they went and they played with it, but it was actually radioactive ash. Uh, to, you know, and there's um, some of the Marshallese believe that, yes, uh, people from these islands were evacuated, but they're actually moved downwind of where the testing took place. So they're convinced that um, that was intentional because the U.S. military wanted to see the effects. Okay. Of, uh, Dave, I'm going to interrupt for a second since we just had a little tech, tech glitch. Um, yep. Can you stop screen sharing and then start again? Because some folks are no longer seeing your slides. Oh, some okay. are. So if you just pause and then just also let you know it's your 15 minute, it's your 15 minute warning. If you want to you stop screen share and then start it again, I think that will fix it. Okay, okay, okay. Let me stop. Whoa, 15 minutes left. Shucks. Um, I still have to go. Um, okay, let me. Okay. Screen share again. And then start again. And I think that should fix it for folks that said. Um... Okay, so are you seeing what, what slide are you seeing now? Okay, better. Everyone's saying it's better. Perfect. Thank you for that. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, no. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> and uh, so are you seeing the nuclear weapons testing in the Marshall Islands? Yes. Okay, okay. So I apologize. I'm going to zoom through the rest of the presentation. I didn't realize I was taking that long, but I kind of tend to get carried away. So this is nuclear weapons testing the Marshall Islands. Um, so COFA is between um, Compact Free Association, it's between the United States and FSM and the Republic of the Marshall Islands between 1986 to 2023, which is next year, and then Palau from 1994 to 2024. And so these allow, COFAs allow the United uh, uh, citizens from these three countries to come into the US to work and live and go to school without having to go through the visa process, which um, before used to take up a long time to do. Now, my communities can just come in with a visa and a, 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 some kind of um, other ID as well. And then they can come in, go back and forth. There's no travel right now, but um, um, that allows for migration. So what does the US get out of it? They get military rights, like I said before. Uh, they have strategic rights over the whole region. They can deny any other country from uh, um, military use of the islands and they can build bases anywhere and anytime they want in the Micronesian region. So that's what the US gets out of it. Uh, so that's really COFA in a nutshell. So COFA itself is an agreement that, that does not end. Um, it, it ends when both countries, for example, FSM and, and US agree to end it. Um, what the days refer to are some provisions to specific to COFA that end, and, and that's basically financial support. Um, so these these what, what uh, the dates are uh, referred to. Uh, the idea is that the, the US helps these islands with financial support, they help them develop, and then after so many years, when they're ready, then the funding stops and countries are able to um, be self-sufficient, but the actual COFA itself keeps going on. Um, so just some um, selected health and economic indicators. Um, so for population, Guam has the highest population. Um, some of this data may be a little bit old, it's really kind of hard to get their current data. 
for underage population is uh, higher in the FSM. Life expectancy is is higher in the uh, uh, the Guam and Northern North Islands tend to do better in these kinds of um, uh, data per capita income. Again, lower in the uh, freely associated states. Average household size higher in uh, FSM. And I'm an unemployment rate is also higher in FSM and the Marshall Islands. Um, there are other health concerns and issues as well. Um, for health, there's really high diabetes rates, high cancer rates, high disease rates. Um, obesity is a big, big problem. Uh, that's actually a lot of the Pacific Islands have issues with obesity. And other issues as well as high unemployment, education, infrastructures is uh, not great. Um, uh, uncertainty about political status, but I'm going into that and then other, uh, I'm consistent with my type of uncertainty climate change. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of the top 10 causes of deaths for the Micronesian uh, islands compared to Hawaii and the United States. So heart disease is actually one, that's one same thing that's similar across all, everyone. Um, and then stroke, diabetes. Uh, the one that kind of stands, uh, stands out for me is self-harm or suicide. Um, it's high in the uh, Micronesian region, unfortunately. And this is really um, uh, among uh, young people, especially males. So young teenagers and young men is very high. If we wrote this down by that demographic, it'd be much higher. Um, so health expenditures, just to give you an idea of how there's not much money to begin with. And even money that's there is not really spent on, on health. So this just compares health expenditures per capita uh, with the US, which is the bottom there in purple, uh, compared to the uh, Micronesian region um, in uh, dark purple, just to give you an idea that it's, it's large discrepancy there. Um, and so all that kind of informed why you saw a lot of uh, Micronesian migration, especially from the 1990s up to now. And so really kind of the more classic reasons for migration for, uh, were unemployment, education, and healthcare. Um, um, and then uh, more recent is climate change. I finally spelled it right. And then, like I mentioned, uncertain political status. So the the these tables here, the up, the one the left in black is the Micronesian population in 2010 and how much it grew between 2000 and 2010. I know we just had a census, but I don't have data that shows the specific breakdown for the Micronesians. Um, but it grew by 79 percent, and then. Um, zooming out nationally, Micronesian population uh, in the US between 2000 and 2010. The numbers are small, the raw numbers are small, but percentage wise, Chukis grew by over 500% to shrine. In fact, all the island, all the uh, Micronesians, except for people from Guam, who are not migrants, they're actually, they're immigrants, they're not, they're not uh, immigrants, because they're already American citizens. Uh, uh, all the other countries had um, in uh, triple digits. And so the lower left, I think you're seeing data. This is from, um, I believe this, uh, um, can't remember the name of the, uh, it's a federal office. Uh, but it just shows, I think up to 2018 or 19, the uh, number of Micronesian migrants by state. And Hawaii has the highest at almost 25,000 followed by Guam, Washington, Arkansas, and Oregon. So it kind of gives you an idea of how Micronesian migrants are spread across the US. Um, so I've talked about Micronesian, actually I spent most of my time talking about the Micronesian region. I'm gonna kind of delve into real quickly into um, uh, what's happening as far as health among Micronesians here in the US. Um, so there's a lot of disparities. So these are differences in health outcomes. Again, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and mental health. Uh, suicide is really high amongst Chukis migrants in Guam. And also in Hawaii, the numbers are very small up until 2000, and I have data up until 2015. But if you break it down by age group, for young people between uh, young up until 24, Micronesians have the highest um, uh, rates of uh, suicide in, um, in Hawaii uh, amongst all groups. And there's also uh, I have studies that show substance abuse in Guam amongst my community here in Hawaii and in Guam. So that's disparity and then inequities, which has to do with unfairness and injustice in the distribution of resources. There's access to healthcare is an issue. There's unfair housing practices, issues with language services, 
and then edu educational outcomes um, as well. Um, so we have to talk about COVID. Um, so uh, uh, Micronesian, Micronesian migrants especially are alarmingly and disproportionately um, suffering from high rates of incidents from cases, hospitalizations and mortality in the US. So um, just to contrast it with hap what's happening in the home islands, so this is April 14, 2021. FSM, back then FSM and Palau did not have cases, but actually Palau has two cases. This is just within the past month. Um, uh, there are two people from Palau who were on Guam. They tested, uh, they wanted to go to Palau, so they got tested, they were negative. So they went to Palau, got tested, and then turned out positive. So FSM still has zero cases, Palau has two cases, Marshalls has four cases, uh, but nothing from Delta, they got and then. CNMI and Guam actually have cases, which are, they have numbers higher than this, but I don't have updated numbers uh, for that. And then for the US, my conditions in the US, for Hawaii, we, I have, latest that I have is between, these data show between March 20 to January of this year. Uh, so even though non-native Hawaiian Pacific I'm sure that we might need in some ones and Tongans account for 4% of the population, they account for 30% of all cases. Again, this is pre-Delta. Um, and then amongst non-native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, uh, the cases were 29% Samoan, Chukus, and the Marshallese. And then that's among uh, non-native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were 52% Micronesian, any. 22%, 25% Samoan, and 23% uh, Marshallese. And then Arkansas, which I don't know if you're aware, they have a pretty large uh, Marshallese population. That I think they have between 15 to 20,000 people in, in Arkansas. Because they, because of the chicken processing plants, they get recruited to work in the chicken, uh, in Tyson specifically. Um, I think they're concentrated in the upper northwest of Arkansas. I can't really remember the name of the county. But they, in that those two counties, they they account for two percent of the population, 90, 19% percent of all cases. This is as of July of last year. So this is pre Delta. Uh, so and back then, compared to whites, Marshallese were seventy one more times likely to be positive. Many times more likely to be hospitalized and 65 more times likely to, to die from COVID. They accounted for 38% of all deaths, another 2% of the population. Just to uh, kind of give you an idea, I'm going to go into uh, social determinants of health and the social ecological model, which I think in part kind of explains these numbers uh, for Micronesians and Pacific Islanders. Um, uh, I just wanted to throw in some there for childhood adverse childhood uh, experiences or ACEs. There really hasn't been a study specific to ACEs, specific to Micronesians, um, but I do have literature that uh, kind of talks about um, ACEs really amongst uh, Micronesian youth and young people. And these are just some examples, discrimination, suicidality, sexual abuse, physical abuse, footage of period domestic violence and substance use, that's just some examples of cases amongst uh, Micronesian youth and people. Uh, so social determinants of health, I think most of you are familiar with this. So it's just where you live pretty much kind of determines your health outcomes. Uh, so this example, I just went through, uh, this is a paper that I'm working on, social determinants of health. So these are the five kind of domains. This is, I'm using the Healthy People 2020 framework. Um, so these are the five domains. And then under those domains, there are some key issues. So for economic stability, there's employment or unemployment, food insecurity, housing stability, poverty. So everything you see in red are is literature that I found that actually shows there's uh, negative outcomes for Micronesians. Everything you see in white, I don't have literature for. So there's, we don't know what's going on there. And everything you see in green, these is only two, um, has to do, these are more positive uh, uh, outcomes. So in this case, for civic participation, for those of you who are aware, back in uh, 2000, yeah, before or before 2010, they, uh, where they started wanting to implement basic health Hawaii that really restricted Micronesian access to healthcare. Um, Micronesia United and really kind of uh, protested against that. And then also social cohesion. Micronesians are very church going, very family oriented, uh, being like being around others. So they have strong social cohesion there. So really, at a glance, you're kind of seeing what's happening as far as social determinants of health 
um, and how it informs um, or uh, contributes to the health disparities that we're seeing amongst migrations. So when I was working on this, Healthy People 2030 came out, so I actually have to change that. Um, so that's social determinants of health and the social Dave, economic. Dave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to wrap up. So I'm gonna stop you there. Okay. okay. <laughs> I know there's huge interest um, in the chat. Um, and what I would suggest in the interest of time, if folks have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we will ask um, Dave to answer them after this. And we, we will be sending out um, likely tomorrow, a link with the recording um, and, and it will also have the transcription as well. So that you are welcome to, um, to rewatch, um, to follow up. And then I think also with Dave's contact information. So if you have questions for Dave, um, but incredibly rich information. Thank you so much. I have a number of folks in the chat saying they would like a, a second follow-up training. So I think we will reach out to you, Dave, to see if that's um, feasible. But please do put um, questions that you have in, in the chat and we can get those answered and email them out to the group um, tomorrow. So uh, any quick questions from anyone before we go? No. Okay. Um, well, we are just at nine o'clock. So I just want to say a huge um, thank you to Dave for this great, very rich uh, presentation. So much fabulous data. Appreciate it all. Uh, everyone is saying it was way too short. So we, we will work to have a follow up um, to this uh, presentation. I apologize and, for there's still a lot more I want to show, and I, I'm more than happy to come back. But I'm going to my time better. We, we will do a part two and or a part three. Um, but I, I will let folks go for today. And folks, um, if you registered, everyone can have, um, we'll be getting, we will be sending the information out so that you can rewatch or, or share um, the slides as well. So thank you so much. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.